Monday, April 15th, 1912. My hands are shaking. I feel hot tears struggling against my eyes, and I have no idea where to begin. I feel a driving need to tell everything properly, exactly as it happened. But my mind is cluttered with confusion and exhaustion and despair and grief. I am overcome by grief. The boat deck. I will go back to the boat deck and follow the evening through from there. Or, no, the story begins earlier, so that is where I will start. It was after midnight, and I could still hear people moving about in the passageway. Before I had time to go out and join them, there was a sharp knock on my door. I opened it to see Robert. He was smiling, but his eyes looked urgent. Good evening, Miss Brady, he said. You need to put on something warm and report to the boat deck with your life belt. Miss Brady? When I heard that, I felt alarmed for the first time. But I was also startled. Had I done something to offend him? That would be terrible. I must have looked upset, because he reached out to pat my arm. A routine drill, he said. No need to fret. I knew he needed to get on with his duties, so I found a smile for him and nodded. If he said it was routine, it must be routine. Robert started for the next stateroom, but then stopped. You'll not want to take your time, Margaret, he said in a very quiet voice. It did not seem possible, but maybe this was not a drill. Robert, I started. Please, he said. There's no time to waste. He looked so worried that I did not want to trouble him with any questions, so I just nodded. I have already broken Mrs. Carstairs, but you will want to urge her along, he said. I nodded again, and he patted my arm once more before moving on to the next stateroom. My hands trembled as I swiftly put on my warmest clothes. My button boots, the thickest petticoat, the gray skirt, a white blouse, and my old brown sweater. Over all of this, I wore father's black wool coat, tucking gloves into one pocket and this diary into the other. On further reflection, I slipped his copy of Hamlet in as well and checked to make sure mummy's locket was safely around my neck. Then I pulled my life belt over my head and fastened it securely. The belt was so bulky that it was hard to walk or even move my arms. Across the hall, Mrs. Carstairs was vexed at the prospect of going outside. Why on earth are you so bundled up, she asked me. They are merely taking precautions. If Robert wanted us to hurry, I trusted he had a good reason. I believe you should approach the situation as though it were serious, I said calmly. We must do as we have been instructed. Well, I hope they lock the staterooms, Mrs. Carstairs grumbled. I have far too many valuables to risk. We had a short argument when Mrs. Carstairs decided she did not want to expose Florence to the cold night air, and that she should remain resting safely in the cabin. I would not hear of that, and put Florence into her sweater at once. Mrs. Carstairs found this cheeky. At the moment, I found her downright stupid. Mrs. Carstairs also balked at putting on her life belt, because it seemed too cumbersome. I was losing patience by now, but fortunately Robert came in just then and took over, giving quiet but firm instructions. Will my valuables be safe, Mrs. Carstairs asked. Ought we not go to the purser? He told her not to worry, because he would be certain to secure the cabins, and that she must go to the boat deck without further delay. As we were leaving, I looked at him, still smiling, but looking very pale in his white uniform jacket. Everything will be fine, Margaret, he said. The crew is terribly well trained. Surely that must be so, but why was he avoiding my eyes? Should we wait for you, I asked. He shook his head. Then you will join us up there, I asked. Straight away, he said. Still, I felt hesitant. Ought I stay down here and help you? I could. He shook his head more firmly, and Mrs. Carstairs sighed. All right, come along, Margie, she said. The sooner we go up, the sooner we can come back down. Robert was nodding, so I bent to attach Florence's leash and lead her upstairs. Just one more thing, Robert said. And then he reached out and checked to make sure that I had fastened my life belt properly. Then he pointed me in the direction of the grand staircase and lifts and hurried off down the hall as a bell rang in one of the other cabins. This is utterly ridiculous, Mrs. Carstairs sniffed as we started up the grand staircase, accompanied by a stream of passengers in various states of dress. We should never have been roused from our beds like this. Has this ever happened to you before, I asked? You and Mr. Carstairs have taken so many trips. In the middle of the night, she said? Certainly not. I found it outrageous, frankly. The step seemed somehow crooked, and I could not figure out why. Was something on the ship broken? 
How could any of this possibly be routine? My heart began to pound, and I was finding it a little difficult to swallow. On the whole, the other passengers seemed to think this was either a jolly game or an irritating inconvenience. There was no running or pushing, or even any raised voices. Mostly people were just joking or grumbling. I relaxed a little, deciding that there must be no good reason to be afraid. When we stepped outside, the sudden exposure to the icy air made me suck in a short breath. Then again, how could anyone think that the ship would hold a routine drill when it was this cold? Such an event would be sheer madness. There must be something terribly wrong here. I wonder how soon they will let us go back downstairs, Mrs. Carstairs growled. This is absurd. The White Star Line will certainly be hearing from me, someone else was saying behind us. The ship's officers and seamen were uncovering the lifeboats and hurling the canvases aside. The passengers were standing in small groups, watching with perfunctory interest and chatting among themselves. A number of people had merely tossed coats on over their nightclothes and wore slippers on their feet. Since they all seemed to expect to go back inside momentarily, I assumed that my nerves must be only a result of my inexperience. But if that was so, why did the deck seem to tilt forward? Surely it ought not to do that. Then again, the Titanic was the finest and safest ship ever built, so there must be a reasonable explanation. The officers were calling for people to board the lifeboats, but almost no one volunteered. The Titanic was so warm and safe, with its bright lights and the dark ocean looked lonely and dangerous. For the time being, it seemed the better part of wisdom to stay aboard. I saw Captain Smith pass by, with ship designer Andrews, and they were both so carefully expressionless that once again I felt a stirring of fear. If there was no problem, they would have been making reassuring remarks, and their faces would lack that tightness. Mrs. Carstairs interpreted their calm manner to, to suggest that everything was perfectly fine, and most of the people around us agreed with her. I wish that Robert would come out here soon. It was so dark and crowded that I was going to have to keep out a very sharp eye for him. There did not seem to be any cabin stewards out here yet, so they must still have things to do below the deck. In the meantime, the officers at the lifeboats were trying very hard to convince people to get aboard. A brave few did so, which encouraged others to follow along. But the first boat appeared to be barely half full. I was sure that there were plenty of boats, so this did not concern me. We would all have our chance. A tremendous amount of steam was bursting noisily out of the funnels above us, and I felt a surge of hope, even though it made my ears hurt. Maybe they were getting ready to start the engines again. Someone was saying that a great crush of ice had fallen upon the aft decks, and that some of the third-class passengers had come up to play an impromptu game of football with the chunks. A few first-class passengers wandered down in that direction to watch, and maybe collect some ice for themselves. Mrs. Carstairs, who was among the unpractically dressed group, shivered next to me. "'I cannot be bothered with this tomfoolery,' she said. "'I am going inside to get warm.' Faint music was coming from the first-class lounge, where the band must have been playing. Tentatively, I started to follow her. "'No, you stay here, MJ,' she said, "'so you can come and report on the progress.' So I stayed outdoors. I was on the port side, and the officers were repeatedly requesting that women and children only step forward. The first boat on our side was slowly filling up, and the second was being lowered to the next deck, so that it would be easier to board. A group of women and children were ushered downstairs to meet it. No sooner had they gone than they returned, because the promenade windows had blocked their way, so the boat behind it began to be loaded instead. The passengers were still very quiet waiting cooperatively to be told where to go and what to do. The only shouts came from the men manning the lifeboats, who yelled things like, Lower away! And, We need an able-bodied seaman over here! And the ever-present, Women and children first! The forward tilt of the deck was, to my eyes, growing more and more pronounced. I could think of no explanation, unless... But we couldn't actually be sinking, could we? Suddenly there was a blinding white light and a strange whistling sound, followed by the boom of an explosion up in the sky. The noise made everyone duck, and now I saw fear in formerly confident faces. My heart was pounding harder than ever, and my stomach began to ache. Distress rockets, someone murmured. Distress rockets? Impossible as it seemed. That could only mean one thing. Immediately I went inside to tell Mrs. Carstairs, and to try to convince her to come back out. I was having little success, but then Mr. Hollings came over and echoed my concerns, 
and she peevishly returned to the boat deck. I took hold of Florence's leash and went after them. Is there really a problem here? she asked Mr. Hollings. He glanced around and then nodded slowly, as though making sure no one else was listening. The word came down from Mr. Ismay himself, I heard. You must find yourself a seat at once. Ismay was the managing director of the White Star Line, who I had been told was traveling on this voyage. He would be one of the people most likely to know the true extent of the damage. Now Mrs. Carstairs' eyes widened, and she allowed Mr. Hollings to guide her over to boat eight. The boat was already partially occupied, and women were hesitantly stepping inside. An elderly woman allowed an officer and a strapping sailor to help her aboard with her maid. Then, just as suddenly, she got back out and went to stand next to an elderly gentleman still on the deck, saying something to the effect of, Where you go, I go. Her husband and the men nearby tried to dissuade her, but she could not be convinced to leave him behind. So the men turned their attention to her husband, suggesting that he get in the lifeboat as well. He refused them with quiet good humor, and the next thing I saw was the elderly couple going off to sit down in deck chairs. They were holding hands tightly and seemed unaware of anything in the world beyond each other. We were sinking. We were actually sinking. My legs felt weak and I had to swallow hard to keep my expression as calm and brave as everyone else's seemed to be. The officers were still trying to fill boat eight, and Mr. Hollings implored Mrs. Carstairs to do as they were advising and climb in. I, I don't know, she wavered. It seems so very dark out there. Perhaps I should. Was there really time to squander quibbling right now? After all, the word had come from the managing director himself, hadn't it? Just get in the boat, Mrs. Carstairs, I snapped. She stared at me looking confused. Mrs. Carstairs, I said again, through clenched teeth, get in the... Before I could finish, she nodded shortly and moved toward the boat with something of an offended flounce. Here you go, ma'am, one of the officers kept saying patiently as he tried to coax people into the lifeboat. Step aboard, ma'am. Women and children only, sir. Husband and teenage sons were escorting their wives and sisters forward and then calmly promising to join them later on. Some of the women meekly obeyed. Others refused to leave at all. I saw a couple of women literally being dragged into lifeboats, sobbing while their husbands stayed behind, smiling wanly. And yet there was still no real sense of panic. I could not tell whether this was because so many did not want to believe that there was any genuine danger, or if everyone was just extraordinarily courageous. I, for one, was growing increasingly frightened. Halfway into the lifeboat, Mrs. Carstairs stopped short. Wait! I'll not go another step without her, she cried out. Mr. Hollings and the nearest officer looked at me expectantly. Without a word, I held up Florence's leash, and Mrs. Carstairs scooped her up and clutched her against her life belt. Wait until the other first-class ladies board, dear, she said to me over her shoulder. Then come along, and we will meet up later. I had been on the verge of stepping in after her, and this coughed me off guard. Should I let the others go first? Considering my station... Maybe it would be better to wait my turn. Maybe it was only right. Besides, I had not seen Robert up here yet. I certainly did not want to leave until I was sure he was safe, too. Come on, the officer said to me, his temper starting to fray. There's no time to waste. I shook my head and stepped away, doing my best to melt into the crowd. I think Mr. Hollings tried to follow me, but it was easy to elude him with the confusion of people milling about and the deafening explosions of the distress rockets still being fired into the air. There were plenty of other boats. I would wait my turn. Later. Writing about all of this is very difficult. There really are no words to describe what those hours were like. I cannot bear to talk, or eat, or, most of all, think. And yet, what can I do but think? At the time, I remember feeling dazed, but also curiously alert. The boats were being loaded, and what had previously been casual partings, with promises to meet up soon, were now wrenching, tearful farewells. Most of the people on deck seemed to be first-class passengers, and I wondered where everyone else was. Probably there were more lifeboats back on the poop deck, or some other convenient place. There seemed to be a limited number up here, and so many people still needed to be taken to safety. I knew almost nothing about ship procedures, but was sure that they would have planned for a situation like this as a matter of course. They did make me wonder why it was necessary for women and children to go first, 
If there was room for everyone, the officer should just load the boats without any form of selection. There must be something going on that we had not yet been told. A number of passengers and crew members were watching the lights of what seemed to be a nearby steamer. A ship must be coming to rescue us. The distress rockets worked. That was why the officers were allowing the lifeboats to be lowered away with empty seats. They knew that we would all soon be saved. But as the moments passed, the lights did not seem to be moving. If anything, they appeared further away. Now some people were saying that the lights were only stars, or maybe the northern lights, and that there was no ship out there at all. Because if there was a ship nearby, how could it not respond to distress rockets? The band had come out onto the deck and was playing a series of light-spirited tunes. By now I was so afraid that my mind was jumbled and I could not concentrate enough to listen. The feeling of collective fear on the deck was starting to spread, and I felt as though I had to escape from it. I would go find Robert and wait with him. I walked slowly toward the aft staircase against the steadily increasing flow of nervously chattering people coming outside. There were still people mingling in the foyer and other common rooms, but most of the alleyways were deserted. I passed a man wearing what might have been a cook's uniform and reached out a hand to stop him. Do you know where I would find the cabin stewards, I asked? He glared at me. The cabins are locked, miss. Go back up to the boat deck. Then, without waiting to see what I was going to do, he continued past me. I noticed how steep the angle of the floor was and quickened my pace. The ship was sinking, and if I tarried down here much longer, I might well sink right along with it. I would just check our row of staterooms, and then I would head back out. Maybe Robert and the others were on the promenade, or helping out on the poop deck, if only the ship were not so incredibly big. It was impossible to find anyone. I checked every alleyway I could find on sea deck, but never saw a soul. Was I the last person still below decks? Would all the lifeboats go without me? Fighting a sudden rush of panic, I was turning to hurry back to the aft staircase, when I saw someone in a white uniform jacket just up ahead of me. Robert! He was sitting down on the carpet, his back against the wall, staring bleakly at nothing. A life belt was lying next to him, but he made no move to put it on. Thank goodness I found you, I said. Where have you been? He stared at me, looking shocked. Margaret, I thought you'd left. What are you doing here? Looking for you, I said. Come quickly. It's not safe to be down here. He looked at me, and his young, sweet face seemed positively ancient. Please go back upstairs right away, Margaret. Your place is on the boat deck. My place? My place because I was female? Or because I was, by a mere technicality, first class? Or was my place waiting to make sure others boarded before I did? Or, tonight, should place have been the most irrelevant thing in the world? Somehow things I accepted my entire life no longer made any sense to me. Robert, I began. Go on with you now, and don't worry about me, he said, looking straight ahead. There isn't a moment to lose. Nothing, not even the great welling fear inside of me, would have allowed me to walk away and leave him there alone. I carefully sat down next to him, my balance unsteady on the sloping floor. Where are the other stewards, I asked tentatively. He shrugged, staring straight ahead. Gone, I guessed, maybe having a bit of a nip for courage. Gone onto the other boats, I asked. Nally looked at me with those ancient eyes. What other boats? Well, there are not nearly enough for everyone on the boat deck, I answered. So I assumed that... There are no other boats, he said. I blinked, trying to figure out what that meant. How can that... There are still so many people aboard. How will they get off safely? But then I knew the answer before he even said anything. They would not get off safely. I would probably not get off safely. The enormity of this was hard to take in, and I had to close my eyes. It was very quiet. Sometimes I could hear running footsteps, or the unexplained creak of a metal. But there was no rushing of water. We must still have been a few decks above the worst of it. Robert let out his breath. You know, you never told, told me how old you are, Margaret. I'll be fourteen in October, I said. Except that now, I was unlikely to see October. For me, it would have been seventeen, in August, Robert said. Would have been? God help us. Then Robert held his hand out. Please allow me to take you back upstairs now. I let him help me to my feet. I insist that you put on your life belt first, sir. Robert smiled, although his lips were trembling. He fumbled for the life belt, 
and fastened it around his waist. I reached over to tug on the strap and make sure it was tight enough, which made his smile widen. Now come on, he said, while there's still time. I knew that it might already be too late, but he was right. We had to try. The staircase was so crooked at this point that we both kept stumbling, but we finally made it up to the deck. I'll see you off here, he said. Are you sure you know where to go? I stopped to look at him, stunned. What do you mean, see you off? You need to come with me. Instead of answering, he reached into his pocket and handed me a white star envelope with an address written clearly on the front. Could you post this to my mom in case I don't get a chance? I just stared at him in horror. Please don't argue, Margaret, he said. Go find a boat quick as you can. I could never rest knowing otherwise. I stood there like a right fool, not sure what to say or do. Please, Margaret, he said, I do not want to be worrying about you. I remembered another dark night when my brother had said, please, Margaret, in that same desperate way. What about you, I asked, hearing my voice shake. I have to go find my mates, so we can all give it a go together, he said. On a night like this, the crew stays together. The deck had tilted so badly now that it was hard to keep our balance, and I hung onto his arm. Please, Margaret, Robert said again, his eyes staring intensely into mine. I do not want to beg you. Although it sickened me somewhere deep inside, I nodded and saw his face relax. Good, he said. Now my mind will be easy. He put his hand out and touched my face for a moment. Would you mind doing me one small favor? Anything, I said quickly, hoping he would ask me to stay here with him. He grinned at me. I should like to remember I kissed a pretty girl tonight. I nodded shyly, and he gave me a small peck on the lips. This was all new for me, and I was not sure if I was supposed to respond in kind. Have you ever kissed a lad before? he asked gently. I shook my head abashed. No, I am afraid that was not very satisfactory. He brushed a small piece of my hair away from my face. So we'll give it another go, eh? This time our kiss was warm and tender. Robert hugged me very tightly and then stepped back looking pleased. You're a natural, Margaret, he said. I'd better find my mates now. Promise me you'll go straight to the boats. I swallowed hard, but nodded. So I have your word, he said. I nodded as tears filled my eyes. Don't worry, love, he said. I'll be fine. He touched my cheek one last time and then was gone before I could stop him. Wherever he went, wherever he is, I wish him Godspeed. Still later. I was crying, but I returned to the lifeboat area. I had promised, so that was what I did. There were still plenty of passengers around. Most of the men, but the boats all seemed to be gone. I swallowed, knowing that I had missed my opportunity, and would now have to take my chances along with the people who remained. I should never have allowed Robert to leave, as we could have tried to swim to safety together. But I had promised. For now, I sank into an empty deck chair to absorb the inevitability of my fate. The bow seemed to be almost underwater, so it would not be long now. The orchestra was still playing nobly away, and I took great comfort from listening to the music. I thought momentarily of writing in this diary, but instead I took out Hamlet and began to thumb through the pages. Margie Jane, a deep voice said, what are you still doing here? I was certain you and Mrs. Carstairs had long since left. It was Mr. Prescott who had dined with us, along with his wife, so many times during the voyage. I scarcely knew him, but it was wonderful to see a familiar face. She left earlier, I said. Where is Mrs. Prescott? His expression tightened, and I deeply regretted having posed the question at all. I sent her on ahead, he answered. Now, come quickly, to the promenade with me. We may just have time. We hastened down there, and I saw a number of women and children climbing across a bridge of deck chairs to get into a lifeboat. There was one left. I felt elated, and inconsolably guilty at the thought of getting aboard. You and the men, I started. Mr. Prescott cut me off. We have no time for idle chatter. Please just come along. Then he raised his voice. Let us through, please, gentlemen. I have a young girl here. Men moved aside without the slightest thought for themselves. 
There are not sufficient words in the English language to honor their valor and gallantry, but I will never forget it, any of it, as long as I may live. Colonel Astor was there, helping his young wife across the treacherous bridge of chairs. I heard him ask if he could stay with her, due to her condition, but the officer refused him. The colonel accepted this gracefully, and asked the number of the boat, so he would be able to find her in the morning. Then he moved away, his dog Kitty trailing behind. A woman was trying to board with her children, but the officer stopped her son and told him to go back and stand with the men. A man who must have been his father protested that the lad was only thirteen. The officer in charge scowled, but let him pass. Another woman was clutching her young son. Then he was wearing a woman's hat. I am not sure who put it on his head, but it may have been Colonel Astor. After that, she and her children were allowed aboard with no comment from the officers. I wish so very much that Robert would find his way here. At only sixteen, they might relent and let him board as well. Except that I knew they would not, and he would not. Quickly now, Mr. Prescott said to me, we mustn't hold things up. I did not know what to do, but found myself impulsively hugging him. You are a perfect gentleman, sir, I said, and a credit to us all. He smiled and let his hand rest gently on my head for a second. Come on now, child. It's time. Mind the chairs. Then, just like that, I was half climbing and half falling into the lifeboat. I recovered my balance and made my way to a seat in the bow. As I sat down the the cry to lower away went up, and my end of the boat dropped toward the water. Next, the bow dropped, and we continued in that erratic fashion. The last thing I saw was Kitty, noble in her own right, staying close by her master's side. The Titanic was so low in the water that we had a very short trip down. We made bulky progress, and one of the two sailors aboard reached for a knife to cut us free. But then we hit the water and were able to cast off. The portholes were still brightly lit, but I could see water rising unchecked through sea deck and making its inexorable way aboard. My God, a woman near me whispered, she really is going down. All around us, heavy objects were crashing into the ocean. At first, I feared that the remaining passengers on the ship had gone mad, but then I understood that the deck chairs and other wooden articles could be used for flotation devices. We had only two men aboard, so another sailor came sliding down the davit ropes to join us. Several more followed in his wake, landing heavily in the boat. A number of women were knocked down and badly bruised as a result. Anyone who was near an oar grabbed hold and started rowing. I was too forward to be of any help, and besides, I was unable to take my eyes off that beautiful stricken ship in what appeared to be her death throes. "'Row with all your might!' a man was yelling. "'Before we get sucked under!' First they rowed one way, then we reversed direction. I had no sense that anyone was in charge." Two men who had taken a chance and jumped off the ship now swam towards us, their arms flailing wildly. They were hauled aboard, shivering from just that brief period in the freezing water. Even then, to my amazement, I could hear the brave sound of violins being played aboard the ship. As the bow began to disappear completely, there was an enormous din of shattering glass and crashing metal from inside the ship. People were leaping into the water from all directions, while others scrambled toward the stern in a frantic, hopeless attempt to save themselves. No one in our boat spoke, or perhaps even breathed. The horror of these last moments was too awful to watch, but it was impossible to look away. Several women gasped as the Titanic's front funnel suddenly ripped free and smashed violently into the water, and then her stern rose higher in the air. I am not sure if the engine rooms had exploded, or if the ship broke in half, but amidst all of the crashing noises, the bow had gone under, and slowly, the stern was lifted straight up into the sky. I could hear distant screams as people were thrown off, or else struggled to hang on. The ship's lights were abruptly extinguished, and then came back on for one final second, before we were all plunged into utter darkness. The clamor of smashing, crashing, tearing metal seemed endless. The stern stayed straight up in the air like that, a stark shadow against the stars, for what seemed like an hour, but may only have been a minute. Then, with an almost stately grace, it gradually slipped beneath the surface of the ocean. The Titanic was gone.